John Tesler from geekycool.com. I'm here with writer and gamer extraordinaire Bill Fawcett. Bill, welcome to geekycool.com. Well, thank you, John. You got started as one of the original D&D &D players. No, second generation. Okay, second generation. Yeah, I wasn't on Gary's group. I was one of Gary's group's people's, his group. So ah. we were still on mimeograph pages. What got you into gaming? I've been gaming since Avalon Hill brought them out. Uh, Roleplay gaming, D&D &D got me into it. Um, although there are um, Kriegspiel, War Talk, where you spoke your way through combat uh, ever since the 19th century. And uh, I've always been interested in simulations um, and their flexibility and what you can do with them. And when D&D &D came out, and um, my old partner Darwin Bromley described that the best, it's quantitized interactive storytelling. And it is basically the ideal creative simulation. And it fascinated me, and I've already done all the folking and everything. Tolkien cost me a grade in the anthropology class. I found it Friday before the final. Read the whole series and only got a B on the final. Um, it was uh, it was just uh, fell in love at first uh, first phrase. Um, had a good DM, and um, pretty soon I was down there writing stuff for the Dragon. Did you get into any of the original video game consoles like the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, ColecoVision, and Television all the way back? In I those go days? all the way back to where I got the original Atari computer. So that I can pay Populous, and that I've I've actually um, I started a company and we did two role play games, one for AOL and one for Simon and Schuster, and then a spin off of a, of um, this is back in the '80s when it was primitive, and um, 2D and barely graphic, and uh, then I did something called Swords of Zine, which was the new um, New World Computing's um, Heroes of Zine series. And we did the rap thing on it because they went out of business and we licensed it. You've done both fantasy writing and you've also done writing and editing real world stuff to the yeah, vein of the military. Nonfiction and military. Um, which do you enjoy more? I wouldn't say it's a matter of enjoyment. It's Writing the fiction is more fun. Re discovering the history, interviewing the people in contemporary or finding original sources from the past on history is fascinating and just as much fun in its own way. And see, my problem is I just love to find things out. I always have. I've been doing it all my life. I'm, I'm <clears throat> in my later 70s and... You'd think I'd stop researching. Um, it's not like I'm going to produce 30 more books, or I might do a book on that someday. I don't have that long left in all probability and reality, but I can't stop. And if I've got a choice between Discovery Channel and a sitcom or something, I'm on Discovery Channel every time because I want to learn. I just can't stop trying to find new facts. Things are fun. History is fun. Things that happen are fun. People are fascinating. And I can't get enough because it's just exciting to discover. I, I found recently, um, I love the Napoleonic Wars. I actually started, my early gaming were Avalon Hill games and Napoleonic miniatures when they were 25 millimeter. And it took you an hour to paint each one and you needed hundreds um, in the early rules. And... Um, I actually discovered some original publications. You know when they always talk in the British Army about you were published um, in the Times? That's the, the, that was their equivalent of getting a medal or something in those days. I found all those. I found all the publishing of the renditions of your battles that was done in the London Times during the Napoleonic War for the Navy. And there are hundreds and hundreds of ship-to-ship -ship combats, each one given in detail. And my God, what great reading material. I have trouble going to bed when I'm reading that one. 
Which do you like more, writing a book or editing? I would say that I like the creation process of writing very much. I just turned a book into Chris Kennedy and his publishing company that's a near-future armored combat, sort of an alt-history book that um, it postulates one thing, that there's a battery that would actually work the powered armor suits, which, of course, DARPA has given up because they can't find extension cords long enough because you can't produce enough power to power them for any period of time. I bypassed that and made it work. And um, I did that series, it's near future, and it was it was a labor of love. And I just loved writing it, and I loved working on it, and I'm work, working on two sequels now with another writer who liked it when he read it, a guy named Casey Moore. And um, I'd say I love that process, and it's, it's a visceral, the creativity um, is satisfying is fulfilling and when you stop you fall asleep thinking about it and you wake up with an idea and if that isn't the best part of life this laying aside a few things that involve my wife um i don't know what is really on the other hand i've edited or packaged uh, put together created the concepts gone through worked with the content on close to 500 books at this point and there is a completely different feeling of satisfaction when you do that, that you're contributing, that you're helping to make something good better, or fix it for not being good in some cases. But it is, you are contributing and you're helping someone else at the same time too, and you're contributing to someone else. Um, doing better and sometimes learning to do better uh, when you edit them and explain why I always I never said, just do this. I said, this will do this, so do this, and let's try this, if you think it'll work. And so it's always a collaborative, my editing is a collaborative process, and there's the extra satisfaction of you're not just doing it yourself, you're working with someone. So editing, by definition, is editing someone else, and therefore, I'm actually dealing with someone besides sitting at my computer for 12 hours a day. One of your more famous nonfiction books is Oval Office Oddities. What's one story that you put in the book that really sparked your imagination? Oh, boy, there was a whole lot of them that did that. You could do the big block of cheese. Andrew Jackson was a populist president. And did you know until... Oh, basically about 1830, they didn't stop anyone who wanted to from walking in the White House, and you there was no secretary, and you basically knocked on the president's door or saw if it was open, and any citizen could walk in on the president of the United States. It was a different time. In fact, to welcome the people who came in to do it, because Andrew Jackson was Tennessee boy, very populous, he um, received as a gift about a two-ton block of cheese and he put it in the lobby of the White House with the knife in it. And people would come in waiting to see the president, mostly to ask for a job, and cut a piece of cheese and sit there and eat the cheese while waiting for their turn to talk to the president and tell them why they wanted to be the postmaster in Okefenokee, Georgia or something. Um, and it said a lot about Andrew Jackson that did that. Of course, Andrew Jackson was a little colorful anyhow. They say he'd been in about 100 duels and was carrying around seven different pieces of metal in him that um, he'd received in various things. He was also a racist and a bigot, and he hated Indians, but he hated the British more. Um, you wrote a book about the seal, about Navy SEALs. What? Um, I edited it. He wrote okay, it. you edited Kevin's book about Navy SEALs. Um, what is it about the military, do you think, that is so fascinating compelling. to people? It is compelling. Well, I'll tell you what was the great joy of doing Hunters and Shooters and the Teams was Kevin and I went around the country interviewing the men who had actually been there about what they did as the first SEALs in Vietnam in the first four years of the war. And there are some 
amazing and wonderful stories, and it was long enough that even most of it got declassified. Why, why do we have an interest in that? Well, um, there is few things more personal than being killed. There are few things more important than defending your home. And all of it is the military in a time of war. All of these things. So it says so much more about humanity and it says so much more about every individual that it makes them a little more. And you see that. There's a lot of people who come back from being, especially in special forces, and they can't stop. They become virtual adrenaline junkies sometimes because it's such a thing, such a strong, emotional, physical, every part of it is more, just more. And the stories about it and the things that you do in it say a lot about humanity, about individuals, and they are powerful. And so at least to me, and I find them fascinating, and so do evidently a whole lot of readers. And I think that's probably the strength of it. Um, they say all fiction, nonfiction, everything is about human, about people. We're a very self-centered race because we don't know any other. Um, and the most people about people thing, besides maybe uh, romance and murder, both of which are seriously intense emotions as well, the most emotional thing is war, is combat, is the courage and the what brings out the most admirable part of someone when that comes out is in situations where it has to be called, and that's war. For a person wanting to be a writer or an editor, what would be the biggest piece of advice you could give them? I would say, there's a few cliches, like don't quit your day job. <laughs> it's a long road to be a writer. Your first million words are practiced sometimes uh, and things like that. There's a lot of cliches. But I think based on my experience, my reality is don't be afraid to be true to yourself and work in what you want. I was a corporate executive in my early 30s making what would be a half million dollars a day a year, a quarter million maybe, for an insurance company. There are, and no offense to people who find it fascinating, to me insurance was probably one of the grayest and <laughs> least future appealing areas, even though I liked the people I worked with and it was very important to society. And I got out and I decided at the age of 41 that I would work with what I loved, science fiction, writing, military history, history. And I found ways from then to make a living and make a comfortable living by doing the things I love. I'm now over a decade past retirement age and I haven't changed my lifestyle very much because what would I do except science fiction, fantasy, games, military history, history, reading, and probably writing about it still. So I just do because I'm, I did what I love for the last over 35 years. And I would say if, if, if you're willing to take the chance and you approach it very carefully so that you're not a starving artist, because hunger does interfere with concentration in writing or editing or anything else. But if you, you approach it either part-time or full-time, but you do it, then take the courage to be yourself and do what will make you happy because what else are you going to accomplish in life? As long as your family eats, that makes you happy. As long as your kids are okay. I mean, if, if, or if it's just you, whatever. But have the courage to try and do it in something you love don't feel required to do it in something that just gives you a check and it will make you a different person. Do you have anything coming out in the future? Never again, from Chris. Um, coming out sometime in the late spring or early summer with three sequels to follow and about six months apart. And that's a book about, it's a postulation that if, if the Kurds had not been 
zapped by the President Trump and betrayed uh, and lost her cook and everything, they were on their way to forming a nice little republic. And um, I idealize them a little in the book. And then um, they're a very militant culture. The Peshmerga, their army is very good. They occupy about half of Syria right now with our approval and help. And I postulate that circumstances come that they begin having to go into the age of conquest. They get the power suits and basically, um, can you say Genghis Khan again? All right. Bill Fawcett, thank you very much for taking some time with geekycool.com. Thank you for having me.